So today, round two, we'll go into why am are we even talking about um, data visualization outside of MIS, and why uh, it it was a problem at least for me and a past organization, um, and then what I propose as a solution, and hopefully it can help you as well. And then we'll go into how we make the database accessible and put some protections around that. And then we'll get in a slight demo, well, a slight examples of how to create visuals using the data uh, in Power BI. And then we can do some Q&A, but I do encourage you to stop me and talk. Uh, we got um, until 11. Is that correct? 11 o'clock? Yeah, till 11. So we'll try to blast through this one. Because there will be the blog following, um, and of course, um, you can always reach out to me afterwards, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, with questions. So the problem that we had was our CISO at the time was going through the whole cybersecurity maturity model, and we were at the point where we needed to define OKRs, but to measure those OKRs, we needed KPIs. And for those KPIs, we needed data. But the data was in disparate systems all over the place. So we had case management tool. We had MISP. We had um, our uh, IAM products with all the certifications for access. We had everything everywhere, but it was all under the umbrella of the CISO. And we needed to show this in a live, dynamic way that constantly updated and was all in one place because you're not going to have the CISO or the CIO or whatever get on the VPN, log into your MISP infrastructure, and look at the dashboard and miss. It's not going to happen. But you also don't want to be generating PowerPoints every day to show him what's going on, or him or her. So my idea was to couple MISP with Power BI. MISP has a relational database at its core that uh, um, MariaDB um, so why not pull that data in? I will preface that pulling this data out of MISP removes all the ACL protection, you know, making sure you're not sharing it with other people. So make sure that you're comfortable and it's yours and it's not going to leave your environment because it could lead to data leakage uh, or uh, removing, you know, this organization cannot see this one. So this is not something you would do and share with a larger group, this is for an enterprise. Or in our case, for our CTI team. So, what is Power BI? Some of you may use it before, some of you may not, but it's a business intelligence tool. There's others like it, like Tableau, um, MicroStrategy, Calibra's kind of similar, a little bit different. Um, but it's free. <laughs> At least the desktop tool is free. You can download it. You can pull data in. You can make reports. You can do transformations of the data um, to be able to bucket it, to be able to slice and dice it um, as much as you want uh, with the current Windows um, system. Then if you want to get into the part where you're making dashboards, you're making them dynamic, you're sharing them with larger communities, you do need the Power BI service, which is part of Office 365. You can get an ad hoc license uh, for users that use it, so you don't have it across the entire environment. But if you're an E5 shop, you already have it. You just may not be using it. It does, um, what it does add, um, like I said, is the ability to create dashboards from your reports. Um, and share them with larger teams. If you're a Microsoft, Microsoft shop, which unfortunately it's kind of, you have to be to some point um, for the most part, you can add Power BI dashboards to Teams channels. You can have it on your phone. You can do all types of stuff with it. So you could actually pull up a missed dashboard on your cell phone wherever you're at, as long as you're logged in with multi-factor and all that good stuff, which is pretty cool. And then you can build something like that, which is just a demo. This is a dashboard in the Power BI service. I used a couple different types of um, searches. 
So basically, you're seeing a word cloud of tags. You're seeing the sectors uh, as far as it's displayed to, by tagging uh, in MISP. And um, this is just using the, um, the circle white, TLP white feed, um, and some other um, stuff that we pulled in from our um, other sources. And these, uh, all these slides will be shared afterwards, so don't worry about missing something. And it'll be on the, the blog, too. So how you start is just making the database accessible. So you do have to change a best practice to do this. You have to make the MiraDB, a MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, whatever you're using, uh, exposed to the, the external IP address so that your Power BI desktop um, product can connect to it uh, and pull in the data. And so you do need to change that uh, bind address to the external address of the system. Um, you do need to, uh, which I kind of skipped, so that's here. So you do need to create a user. Um, you want it to be separate from you know, your root user, your MISP user. Create a specific user for Power BI. Only give it select permissions so it can't modify or anything like that, and only to the MISP database. Set up some type of access control. Um, setting up a host-based firewall to restrict access is just one example. You could set up other um, known host keys, uh, only allow certain users, uh, et cetera. And then, um, like I said, make sure that it's accessible externally, and then you're going to test your access. So I test the access locally on the box, make sure the user can authenticate the Power BI user, but then I use MySQL Workbench uh, to test the connection before I get into Miss, I'm not Miss uh, Power BI because Power BI doesn't give you a lot of information on the errors that you may get from authentication issues. So I use uh, MySQL Workbench, uh, and of course, by default, the connection to the database is unencrypted, which you could change if you want to put in keys. Uh, but um, in most modern versions of MySQL Workbench, you do have to set the use SSL zero in the advanced tab to be able to connect to the database. It'll give you a warning saying you're connecting uh, over an unencrypted channel, um, and then you go for it. And then you should get something like this. So you'll see all the tables, and you'll see all the data in the tables. Um, I've listed just the galaxies table there, so there wouldn't be any uh, events uh, shown on the big screen. But uh, so now you know that your Power BI user can access the MISP database from the workstation that you're using for Power BI. And then you feel like this guy. You put the final infinity stone in, and you have all the data at your fingertips. And then you open up Power BI, and there's going to be a, uh, and this, I didn't put all the screenshots in here, but in Power BI, there'll be a connect to connect data button. You, um, and I am skipping a part. You do have to install a MySQL.net connector for Power BI. Uh, out of the box, it's only going to speak SQL. Uh, Microsoft products, um, connecting to Azure blob storage, you know, that sort of thing. You do have to install a third party, um, but it's from Oracle. You go to Oracle's website, you download the connector, you install it. You make sure you have the latest version of .NET installed as well. And then you'll have a drop down option to connect to a MySQL database or MySQL like database. Maria just being a fork. Um, and then you can, by default, it's going to bring up the Windows authentication. So just select database. And then put in the username and the password and the schema level of the data or the database that you're going to connect to. And then if everything works as it should, you'll get a list of all the tables that you can select. Don't select them all. Don't import the correlate, uh, correlation table into your laptop. It will not be good. So. What I do is I pull these tables in, and this is in the blog as well. Um, some of them being new, uh, such as the or over correlating values, which is very handy, especially for dashboarding purposes, and you can link it to uh, sock events and stuff 
if you have that data in your Power BI as well. Um, but these um, aren't crazy big except for the attributes table. The attributes table can get pretty large, um, but I have not had any issues. Of course, this is my workstation that I use for this purpose. Um, workstation laptop, 64 gig, i7, et cetera, 64 gigs of RAM. Um, don't open up multiple Power BI instances when you're doing this. Um, so it does use a lot of memory because um, everything, a lot of the data is stored in memory while you're slicing and dicing it. So make sure you have enough uh, memory on your workstation. Uh, don't do it on your Chromebook. So um, once you select the tables that you want to import, it'll start pulling in the data. And you can see the miss. Well, the missed tags uh, table actually is the biggest because it's got multiple tags for each event uh, or each uh, attribute. Um, and once it pulls in all the data, uh, it'll display um, the Power Query Editor where you're able to go in and start doing some slicing, dicing, relationship building, etc. Advanced use case would be to use direct query instead of table import. Um, direct query, you write a long SQL query of the exact tables, the exact uh, um, timestamps, et cetera, that you want to pull in. So you only want to pull in the last year, but you have to be creative with joins, et cetera, because it doesn't understand the relationships. Uh, and then you uh, can pull in only a subset of the data. So ETL, if you haven't heard of ETL, it's a data analysis term. Um, Extract, transform, and load. So what we just did was extract. And then we're going to transform it inside using the Power BI tool. And then we're going to load it into the Power BI data model, which allows us to make visualizations, drill down into the data, uh, filter the data, et cetera. And like I say here, uh, if you haven't looked into this space and you're very interested in this topic, there is a ton of job openings and lots of money to be made in data analytics. But basically, uh, like I said, you're going to extract it. You're going to transform some things like we'll talk about in a minute to something that Power BI understands. Um, and then you're going to load it into the model. You're going to look for errors, uh, which Power BI is uh, very good at telling you that you have an error. Uh, in a column, in a field, et cetera. And then you're going to adjust and then extract and then continue the process. You will have to continue to monitor for errors. Errors, If something changes in your environment, you upgrade the operating system that MISP is running on. MISP has some updates. So there's new tables, uh, et cetera. There will be issues. So transforming the data. One of the biggest things you need to do out of the box is convert the Unix timestamps to date time. So this is an example of how you do that um, inside Power Query. So you basically transform the column, and you would just convert that epoch time to date time. And then you'll be able to do month, year, quarter, day, et cetera, when you're doing your histograms, et cetera. It doesn't understand the big, long string of numbers. Um, other things you can do is remove some columns. So we all love the first scene, last scene, but it's hardly ever populated from other people. So I just remove that column uh, unless there's a specific use case that you need it for a visualization. Um, and you can remove any other columns that won't be used for visualization. That way, when you upload or publish this to the service, uh, it's as small as possible. Um, you can break things apart. So like tags, we know it's like uh, the header of the tag and then the sub and then the, the actual value of the tag. You could split that up so you have short tags, long tags, et cetera. Um, you could calculate duration. So when was the event seen to when was it published last, et cetera. Um, and you can also do GeoIP lookup or any type of scripting, really. You can do web requests, et cetera, to transform the data live. Mapping relationships. So MySQL is a relational database. Power BI uses relationships to be able to filter data across values and tables. So building this part of the whole Power BI process is the longest part. 
So you need to understand how MISP works. You need to understand that the MISP attributes tag table relates to the MISP attributes table, and the MISP attributes table lists the events that the attributes are in, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you need to build those relationships. And sometimes you need to change the name of a column, which you can do because it's now outside of MISP. You can change it how you see fit, how it works for you for visualization purposes. So in all of these tables, they all have an ID column, but it's ID to that specific table, which makes it very confusing to Power BI because it thinks that ID is the same key for every table. So it tries to relate that automatically and it doesn't work. So you do, I do change the ID to the ID of the table. So instead of tag, uh, instead of, uh, like event ID or ID in the events table, I change it to event ID. And then I'm able to map it without, uh, Power BI getting confused. One thing in Power BI is you can't have multiple relationships for the same column, even though there are multiple relationships for the same column using in MISP, you use the joins and the PHP views and everything, and you can have multiple relationships for different tables. But when you're filtering and Power BI is trying to do visualizations, there can't be any ambiguity. This has to relate to this. It can't relate to more than one thing because then it doesn't understand how to filter. Which one do I filter? Do I filter this one or that one? Um, so you can have, and you can barely see it, but this one, the ones that are slightly less gray are secondary relationships, and they are deactivated by default. Um, you can activate them with a custom function uh, if you need to, but by default, they will be uh, deactivated uh, and will not apply and how this works and why this is makes it powerful in Power BI is if the attribute is mapped to the event and is that mapped to the tags, if I filter on a tag, it's going to filter all the data from the tables that are related to that tag. So the, di the dashboards are dynamic. So if I click on Cobalt Strike and I also have a visualization that has all the IP addresses related that are tagged from Cobalt Strike, it'll remove anything that's not Cobalt Strike related. So what we're going to do for you, if you're curious in this topic, is we're going to publish this relationship uh, map to our GitHub for everybody to use. So you don't have to go through this effort. Um, we're actually going to do it as a Power BI template. So all you have to do is connect your data source. It'll automatically pull out the tables. It'll pull out the relationships. It'll do the custom fields. It'll do the custom mapping. It'll even do the GOIP lookup. Although the GOIP lookup will fail because you need to put an API key for um, the service that it calls out to to get GOIP data. Um, so that will be published today. So once you have everything mapped, you have all your tables selected, then you can start making visualizations. Uh, this is just a simple histogram of events over time. Uh, and some of the interesting or uninteresting things that um, Power BI does is it tries to bucket time and things in time. So right here, you're seeing January through December, but you're seeing it for 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. So everything that happened in January, regardless of the year, is in that column. That's not, we don't want that. I don't care. Um, it may be interesting if you're looking at threat actor or activity and they actually do take Christmas break um, or Valentine's Day, something. And then they come back from spring break and they're like, let's attack shit. You know? Um, so that, yeah, that's interesting, but usually you want to know what happened last quarter compared to the quarter before that, et cetera. So like visual studio code, et cetera, there's monthly releases to power BI. So if you open up power BI in August and then you open it up again, October 1st, there'll be an automatic update, new features added. Um, August, 2022 they added a feature to help with this issue. So before August, you had to write DAX queries, which I won't even go into in this talk, to be able to bucket things properly. Well, now 
all you have to do is click this little double arrow icon here, and it'll change the hierarchy. And it'll bucket it as it should be bucketed. And then you'll get it like this. So you have all your quarters, and you can get rid of quarters on the side. If you don't want to see quarters, you only want to see year and month, however you want to see it. But it puts it in the right columns. And then if you want to go back to the other way, you just click the up arrow for the hierarchy there. And what's neat about Power BI and Power BI reports, if you share this report with somebody else, they can do this too. Even if they don't have right permissions, they can still change the view. They just won't be able to save it or change the way a, a custom function is written, et cetera. They won't be able to change the visualization permanently, but they can modify it um, as they see fit. So getting close to the end, um, but there's some other, other visualizations that you can use in Power BI. Um, one new one, or most of these are new except for maps, Slicer. So you used to have to save filters in Power BI and then create buttons, and then you could click the 2022 button and everything would change to 2022. Well, they've created a slicer now, and you can put it at the top of your main page or on every page, and it can filter on a certain uh, field, whether it be the date field, a tag, what have you. If it's a date, and uh, we'll get into it in a minute, it can slide, or you can do a drop down um, and alter either that page that it's on or the entire report, multiple pages. And then uh, you can do a text filter on any field. So if you want to be able to search all your reports for 8.8.8.8, you can do that as well. String search. Uh, Q&A is a beta uh, visualization using some natural language processing uh, capability. Um, a little bit of machine learning, but you can ask questions about your data um, in human language. So an example would be an, an easy one. How many attribute IDs are there for per month from each org? And it'll automatically create that for you. Um, you'll see a little spinning thing for five seconds or so, and then it'll tell you. Um, and it also suggests questions as well. And then uh, maps, you can GOIP, um, do lookups, and then you can map them. Um, and then you can also split the bubbles, whether it's a um, payload delivery or a network activity, um, et cetera. So this is an example of um, most of those visualizations. So this is the slicer where you can move the bar to change the date time of your report. This is the text search, and you can see 8.8.8 .8 .8 is in five events across this data set. And it can, so there's two in the Q1 of 2021, and then one in each month here listed of 2022. And then how many attribute ID are there with all these filter sets, filters set? And it, it's simple, but you can see the potential uh, there's five attributes. And then I was going to go into a live demo, which is very dangerous. But uh, we got a little bit of time, unless there's questions about way over there. I'll get the, uh, the let's see if I can get this pulled up real quick. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation first. Uh, actually, I've got two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what made you choose uh, uh, Power BI over uh, other data BI value visualizations such as Tableau or Google Data Studios, for example? So Tableau, um, extremely expensive, uh, requires on-prem server plus the cloud, cloud server, etc. And we were already moving to E5 license, so it just made sense to use Power BI. Um, and I had already been playing with Power BI on my own because it was free. Um, so it was a natural move. In the end, um, which 
this is uh, in the, the heads of executives somewhere, which I'll never understand. We decided to move away from Power BI and go with MicroStrategy. Um, but that was in the data analytics side of the house. Uh, and that decision was made, and then I left. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the second one was, uh, I've heard a few months ago about the natural language request uh, of Power BI. Um, how deep does it go? I mean, can you ask for complex questions or do you automatically automatically use the uh, refiner with the event and then uh, use how many event for this time or all those kind of things? go pretty deep um it does so it it uh, allows aliases so if uh, and you have to set that up on your own um but if you know um that um a certain string keyword can mean multiple things um then you can use those aliases to get a better answer um but you can ask complex questions such as of all the orgs that we've seen in the last quarter, how many were affected by uh, APT29? And then it'll do things like that. So it'll pull the MITRE attack tags for APT29, the organizations that shared that data, all the other tags around that type of data, including the attributes, and pop it up. So we've used it for that purpose before. Um, or something like Cobalt Strike, you filter on that, hoping that everything has been contextualized enough that it can pull that data, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're on time, no worries. Okay. We have one more question. Uh, hello. Uh, first, I have uh, two questions. The first one is uh, why having chosen um, MISP rather than OpenCTI? Uh, and the second one is, do you know if it's possible to also use a Power BI with uh, OpenCTI? I don't know if you could use... Uh, well, I'll answer that one quickly because it's easy for me. I don't know uh, if you can use Power BI. Um, you can import a lot of data sources into Power BI. It's limited by the connectors that are available. Um, why did we choose uh, MISP over... Um, I would say they're two different tools in my eyes. They're used for two totally separate purposes. We are looking at OpenCTI, but more from a threat actor tracking and reporting point of view. Um, especially around Tiber assessments, et cetera. We're going to possibly store our scenarios um, as we build them in there so they can be reused um, and then related to the TTPs of the threat actor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other than that, um, I personally have been using MISP since 2014, 15, um, and so have uh, members of the community. It's a... It's very uh, widely used in Europe, et cetera, so it just made sense um, at this point to use this. I've kicked many a commercial vendor out and put this in its place also. So. Any other questions? If you're brave enough for the demo. <laughs> Trying to get it pulled up. Might have to just show the. So no cameras or anything. There will be some event names here, please, uh, from first. Um, so no details. So I guess it's okay. Power. Um, there you go. So this is uh, Power BI Desktop, and this is our curation. Um, report. So, um, basically looking at all the workflow complete tags over here. Um, this is not in the dashboard form. This is on the thick client on the laptop itself. Um, so we were able to have this up or check this, check this on our phone, etc. Uh, if we have things that we need to do. So we have 21 events. This was, this data was pulled yesterday. Um, but usually it's, uh, it updates hourly. 
Um, so we know that there's some events that need to be curated. And then there's a list of those events uh, listed below. Um, and then this is just an example of a ribbon uh, visualization. Each color is a different org C. So you can see uh, as, as events come in, um, some die off, um, et cetera, over time. And then you can add tool tips uh, and context. So as you hover over things, I'm not going to do that because you'll see the name of the org C, um, which is why it only has the org C ID here. Uh, for this, uh, we'll change it back <laughs> afterwards. Um, but yeah, you know, just an example of what you can do. This is the overtime that you saw in the slide. And this is an example of the GOIP where you can filter using the text. So, vault. Well, hold on. Probably had to put that in the quotes. Well, see, live demo. Maybe I don't have anything tag Cobalt Strike in this subset of data. Oh, there you go. TLP white events. And then you can drill down. And you can see network activity separated from payload. And then how many in that one. Show data point as table. And then you can, you can drill all the way down to the actual specific piece of data that's making that visualization happen. And then this is the Power BI uh, service. And then you can create, this is an org inside of the Power BI service where you can publish your dashboards and your reports and your data sets. And this is what a dashboard, the same thing in a report format, in a dashboard format. And then you can stretch it out. Oh, come on. Stretch it out. Yeah. But you can... Imagine that you have all the information from your case management system and your IAM tools and last certifications and God knows what else you can put in um, and then start correlating that data, filtering it across uh, different reports. Um, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. All right. That's my talk. Talk. <laughs>